The central focus of every New England town was the meeting house, used for both religious worship and for conducting town business. In fact, the origin of the town meeting form of government, still prevalent in New England today, can be traced to the meeting houses of the colonies. Welcome to the meeting houses of Barnstable. Early meeting houses were very simple buildings without statues, decorations, or stained glass. Not even a cross hung on the wall. Since towns were originally settled by people of one religion, colonial governments supported the church through taxation. The meeting houses that survive today were generally built in the last half of the 18th century, making this meeting house in West Barnstable built from 1717 to 1719, among the oldest meeting houses in the country. The styles are remarkably similar. Most were almost square, with a steep pitched roof running east to west. There were usually three doors. The one in the center of the long south wall was called the Door of Honor, and was used by the minister and his family, and any honored out-of-town guests. The other doors were located in the middle of the east and west walls and were used by women and men, respectively. A balcony, called a gallery, would usually be built on the east, south, and west walls, and a high pulpit would be located on the north wall. Box pews, also referred to as sheep pens, were either rented or purchased for families. Single men and women would typically sit in the balconies. Large windows would be located at both the ground floor and the gallery levels. It was a status symbol to have a lot of glass in the windows, because glass was expensive and had to be imported from England. Generally speaking, sites for meeting houses were chosen by the town and were reserved for public and pious uses. Pious use was for the worship of God. Public use was for regularly summoned town or civic meetings. Join me as we explore the meeting houses of Barnstable. The Reverend Henry Jacob was born in 1563 and was a graduate of Oxford at age 18. After receiving his degree, he was ordained a priest in the Church of England and taught for a few years in Oxford. Prior to 1600, Reverend Jacob had identified himself with the Puritan party within the Church of England. He even published a number of texts discussing Puritan objections to practices of the Anglican Church. In 1604, he was imprisoned for his writings by the Bishop of London and spent about a year in the clink, London's most notorious prison. In 1608, despairing of any reform, Reverend Jacob moved to Holland and settled in Leiden with Reverend John Robinson. Together they shared and shaped their views about the reform of the Church of England. Robinson ended up favoring separatism from the Church of England, and his followers left England for Plymouth in 1620. Reverend Jacob had more moderate views. Attempting to follow a middle course, he never repudiated the Church of England. Instead, he hoped to remain in communion with her. So Jacob returned to London in 1616 and formed a church in the borough of Southwark. Still, they had to meet in secret. That church was the first to be called Congregational, a label Reverend Jacob was the first to use. In 1622, at the age of 60, Jacob resigned from his pastorate of the Southwark Church his successor was 38-year-old Reverend John Lothrop, a graduate of Cambridge. Under Lothrop's leadership, the church grew to 60 members, but they still had to meet in secret at the houses of members or even, at times, in the sand pits at the edge of the borough. In April of 1632, while the church was meeting at a home of one of its members, the house was surrounded by officers of the king. 42 members were arrested and imprisoned in the clink, including Reverend Lothrop. In the following months, some of the members were released, but Lothrop remained. He was still incarcerated and his wife had died. 
the oldest of Lothrop's nine children, petitioned Bishop Lambeth to ask the king for his father's release. His distressed and helpless younger brothers and sisters were now wandering the streets as beggars. In the summer of 1634, King Charles I released Lothrop on the condition that he be exiled from England. On September 18th, Reverend Lothrop and 30 of his followers arrived in Boston on the ship, the Griffin. They moved immediately to Situate, where some of their followers had already settled. By the end of 1635, a meeting house had been erected in Situate. But by 1637, friction developed between the Lothrop congregation and the other settlers of Situate. Disputes over church discipline arose. There were also problems with the distribution of land. In 1638, Reverend Lothrop wrote to Governor Prince, who offered land in what is now Wareham and Marion. But the offer was declined because the site offered very little more cleared land than what they had in Situate. In June of 1639, another offer of land was made, this time in Mattachies. The Native American name Mattachies meant plowed fields. Some of the land had already been cleared by the Native Americans and the Great Salt Marsh provided a ready crop of salt hay. This was perfect. The name chosen for the new village was Barnstable, since the area posed a striking resemblance to Barnstable, pronounced with a B but spelled with a P, England. Reverend Lothrop and 22 members of his congregation arrived in Barnstable in October of 1639. Part of the group drove the livestock overland for the 60-mile trip, while the rest of the group arrived later by water, crossing nearly 40 miles of Cape Cod Bay. One of their first acts once everyone had arrived was a celebration of the Sacrament of Communion, using the pewter vessels that the congregation had brought with them from England. This celebration was held at what is still known as Sacrament Rock. But they were not the first settlers in Barnstable. Reverend Joseph Hull and a small congregation had arrived earlier in the spring of 1639, having been forced out of Weymouth for their beliefs that the church should be closely aligned with the Church of England. He too had used Sacrament Rock as a place to preach. Apparently though, Hull made no effort to perform any ministerial functions in Barnstable after the arrival of Reverend Lothrop. About a year later, Joseph Hull moved into the adjoining town of Yarmouth at the request of some of the residents. He served them in a ministerial capacity there. However, he neglected to secure the approval of the Barnstable Church and was excommunicated on May 1, 1641. On August 10, 1643, it was recorded that Mr. Hull, in the acknowledgement of his sin and renewing his covenant, was received again into fellowship with us, the us being the Lothar congregation. But Reverend Hull was a pastor without a church. Apparently he was somewhat lacking in his interpersonal skills. So he started wandering from place to place, a transient preacher, until he eventually landed on the Isle of Shoals off the coast of New Hampshire. Barnstable, with Reverend Lothrop as the sole leader of the congregation, continued forward. Between 1639, when Reverend Lothrop's group arrived in Barnstable, and 1646, indications are that the congregation gathered around Sacrament Rock in favorable weather, and in their homes in unfavorable weather. This monument is made from fragments of the original, much larger rock that was on the south side of, and extended out beyond, current Route 6A. After the construction of Reverend Lothrop's house in 1644, the congregation met in his front parlor. Lothrop's house is still standing and is part of today's Sturgis Library in Barnstable Village. However, by 1646, the congregation had outgrown Lothrop's front parlor. Across the road from where Reverend Hull's home had been, on what is now known as Lothrop Hill, the first meeting house was built, described in some writings as being a mere cabin. 
About two years after building the meeting house, open land to the east started to be used as a cemetery. According to Reverend Lothrop's diary, Patience Cobb was buried May 4th in 1648, the first that was buried in our new burying place by our meeting house. So Patience Cobb became the first person to be buried in what is now known as Lothrop Hill Cemetery. Earlier dead were buried in the Cavs' pasture, which was the field at the end of present-day Scudder's Lane, formerly known as Cavs' Pasture Lane. This was the burial ground for the first nine years of the Barnstable settlement. Unfortunately, the graves were unmarked and are lost to history. The Reverend John Lothrop ministered until his death in 1653. After his death, the church was without a pastor for about 10 years. Freeman's History of Cape Cod, Volume 2, states that Mr. William Sargent officiated for a time. Also, Reverend John Smith is reported to have officiated for a while. Additionally, Mr. John Mayo of Eastham supplied as a teacher. Plymouth Church records of November 1654 state, the unhappy difficulties that fell out of the church at Barnstable had such an ill influence on the church at Plymouth that together with the unsettledness of the church and the going away of diverse numbers of its members, yea, most of the eminent of them, it was the means of the unsettlement of that holy man of God, Reverend John Raynors, its pastor. So the unsettlement of the church in Barnstable was so great that it affected the pastor of the First Church of Plymouth, originally located on this very spot at the foot of Burial Hill in the Plymouth Town Square. In 1663, Reverend Thomas Wally was ordained as pastor in the Barnstable Church and ministered for 15 years. He was the last of the ministers of the Barnstable Church who had received a degree from an English university and had been ordained in the Church of England before becoming a Congregationalist. When Reverend Wally first arrived in Boston earlier that year, he was called as minister by the First Church there. But he refused and moved to Barnstable instead, perhaps influenced by the reports of unhappy divisions in the Barnstable Church. As it turned out, Reverend Wally was a man of stature who was able to bring harmony out of the discord that was prevalent at that time. Unfortunately, he was not very good about keeping accurate records of the church. There are no records of baptisms or members received by Reverend Wally, nor are there any records of decisions reached at church meetings. Instead, he gave himself to the spiritual cultivation of the people of Barnstable. After his death, the records of the church reported the Lord was pleased to make him a blessed peacemaker and improved him in the work of his house here until March 24, 1677. Another period of distress came upon the church after Reverend Wally's death. For five tempestuous years, Barnstable was again without a minister. The Congregational Church was without a pastor from 1678 to 1683. During that time, Barnstable built a new meeting house. The second meeting house was larger than the first. Unfortunately, no known drawings of the meeting house exist today. The land cost one pound ten shillings. The building cost one hundred pounds which was paid for from the sale of some land that the town owned in Mount Hope, Rhode Island. It was built on the shore of Coggins Pond, now known as Hinkley Pond. For religious gatherings and functions, the second meeting house was known as Great Marsh's Church. In 1683, Reverend Jonathan Russell, a Harvard College graduate, was ordained as the new minister. Some writings suggest that he actually began preaching in 1681, two years earlier. He was the first minister of the church who was born and educated in the New World. Upon arriving in Barnstable, he moved into the house where Reverend Thomas Wally had lived. Additional change was right around the corner. In 
The Massachusetts Charter of 1692 changed the colony's base from theocratic to political and secular. It was no longer necessary to be a church member to vote on civil affairs, giving birth to a new class of citizen. Citizens were now male property owners who lived in Barnstable and who may or may not have been members of the church. In 1708, 19 people were dismissed from the Barnstable Church to form a church at Suckenesset, which is current-day Falmouth. Before this, the scattered settlers in Suckenesset had belonged to the Barnstable Church and had to make the long journey from Falmouth to attend services or to bring their children for baptism. That church in Suckenesset would grow to become the first congregational church of Falmouth, located on the Falmouth Town Common. In 1700, the town of Barnstable had been divided into two precincts for the purpose of training of men-in-arms. This dividing line crossed Sandy Neck, ran west of Cavs Pasture Point and Coggins Pond, and straight to the shore of Cooper's Pond, which was the name of current-day Lake Wequawket. The line continued in a gentle curve southward to what is now Scudder Bay. By 1712, the town had grown so large that a reoccurring concern at town meetings for several years was the formal division of the town into two parishes and the building of two meeting houses. The same dividing line from 1700 was proposed to be used for dividing Barnstable into its two parishes, east and west. Reverend Russell preached until his death in February of 1711. He was followed in October of 1712 by his son, Reverend Jonathan Russell, one of the early graduates of the young and struggling Yale College. Jonathan, too, had been called to be minister on condition that his acceptance of the call would not prevent the division of the town into two parishes and the calling of another minister. Although Reverend Russell agreed to this, he opposed it and apparently did everything in his power to prevent it. Reverend Russell also protested the action of 24 men who in 1716 took it upon themselves to begin the construction of a meeting house here on Cobbs Hill. He successfully persuaded the church to vote its disapproval and the 24 men were cited for insubordination. An ecclesiastical council of ministers and delegates from other churches in the colony was called to consider the matter. The council condemned the action of the 24 as being irregular, but suggested that the church accept what they had done. The council also reported that both sides had shown too much heat and had tended rather to exasperate each other's spirit than to cultivate peace and love. Meanwhile, a piece of high ground on the land of John Crocker was chosen as the site for the West Parish Meeting House. A proprietor's meeting was held on April 11, 1715. Colonel John Otis was the moderator. Town land was traded, laying out four acres. Three acres would be used for public use, and that land is now the town green just north of the Meeting House. The additional acre was where the West Parish Meeting House would be erected. Finally, in 1717, Barnstable officially voted to divide into two parishes. The villages of West Barnstable, Osterville, Marston's Mills, and Catuit were in the West Parish. The villages of Barnstable, Centerville, then called Chiquacket, and Hyannis were designated to the East Parish. The West Parish Meeting House could now begin construction. The East Parish Meeting House, having somewhat jumped the gun, continued its construction. During the town meeting of March 1719, two significant votes were taken and passed. First, that the town choose a committee to wait on Mr. Russell in order to his taking his choice which precinct he will go to be the minister of with as much convenient speed as may be. And second, to choose a committee to dispose of the old meeting house for the town's use when the West Precinct have their meeting house ready for the worship of God. <laughs>
East Parish Meeting House was constructed first and completed in 1718. The first service was held that year, presumably with Reverend Jonathan Russell II presiding. But once Reverend Russell made his decision to join the West Parish in 1719, the East Parish was without a pastor until 1725, when Reverend Joseph Green was appointed. For most of the 18th century, the people of Chiquaquet, the area settled to the south of Great Pond, which is now known as Lake Wequaquet, attended the East Parish Congregational Church on Cobbs Hill. Women would walk the entire distance, carrying their best shoes and stockings in their hands until they arrived at a large rock along the roadside. There they would change, leave their walking shoes behind the rock, and change back upon returning from services. That rock came to be known as Grandma's Rock and still stands next to Finney's Lane. By 1753, the original East Parish Meeting House was deemed too small. A committee was formed to determine the best way to enlarge it. They decided to cut the building into two parts and move them 15 feet apart and join the two together with a new section. The new and enlarged 1753 East Parish Meeting House served the community well for about another 80 years. In 1796, Chiquaquit built a church at the southern end of Lake Wequaquit. It was located on the north side of Finney's Lane, where current day Strawberry Hill Road intersects. It also was used as a meeting house for secular purposes. As a house of worship, villagers enjoyed services every fourth Sunday when the minister from the East Parish would visit and deliver a sermon. All other Sundays, the villagers would once again make that long walk back to the East Parish, carrying their shoes with them. In 1826, the Finney's Lane Colonial Church and Meeting House was dismantled and carried by ox cart to its current location on Main Street in Chiquaquit. In 1834, Chiquaquit changed its name to Centerville. In 1848, the steeple and bell were added. Initially, in the 1700s and early 1800s, both East and West parishes were Congregationalists. But there was considerable theological debate in the Churches of the Standing Order in New England. Many churches split over this debate, the traditionalists becoming Congregationalists and the Liberals becoming Unitarians. In Barnstable, the church in the West Parish followed the line of tradition and remains to this day a Congregational Church. The East Parish Church, however, leaned toward the Liberal side of the debate and in 1836 became identified as the Unitarian Church of Barnstable. It was during this time that the old meeting house was demolished and a new church was constructed on Cobbs Hill. This new Unitarian Church was dedicated on December 28, 1836, and enjoyed 69 years of fellowship before it was destroyed by fire in January of 1905. Almost before the ashes of that church were cold, money was being pledged for a new church. The present edifice, designed by Guy Lowell, the architect of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, was constructed in its place and was dedicated in 1907. Construction began in 1717 and took two years to complete. Reverend Russell II submitted his decision to minister to the West Parish in August of 1719. His first service here was in November of 1719, a day which was proclaimed an official day of Thanksgiving. The 1717 Meeting House went on to serve as the home of the West Parish Congregation and for the next 130 years was also the scene of the Barnstable Town Meetings, reflecting the close union of the state and the Congregational Church that existed in early Massachusetts. Within a handful of years of its 1719 completion, 
The meeting house was too small for its growing congregation and its secular meetings. So in 1723, the building was split in half and the ends were pulled apart so that 18 feet could be added in between. At that time, a bell tower was built with a gilded cock weather vane measuring 5 feet 5 inches from the bill to the tip of the tail flying high atop. That same rooster crowns the tower to this day. Throughout history, the Meeting House was more than a site for religious services. It was also used as a school, as a venue for public forums and debates, and for town meetings. Historians have discovered that 15 years before George Washington was born, men of Barnstable debated town affairs in the 1717 Meeting House. Men who came back from the French and Indian Wars recounted their battles. Tories and Patriots argued bitterly. Stormy town meetings, particularly during the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 periods, would often necessitate major repairs to the meeting house interior. Some of the famous names of this era included James Otis Jr., Mercy Otis Warren, Mad Jack Percival, and Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw. In 1806, a half-ton bell was cast by Paul Revere for the town of Barnstable and was given to the church in memory of Colonel James Otis. New research in 2016 revealed that, due to a crack, the original bell was replaced by the Revere Bell Company in 1833. That bell still summons the West Parish of Barnstable Church to worship on Sunday mornings. Almost from its 1717 beginning through the 1880s, the 1717 Meeting House was used as a school, educating such notables as James Otis Jr. and his sister Mercy. In 1851, while still a student, Rebecca Crocker made a pencil drawing of the Meeting House. Her drawing is the only detailed image of the original 1717 Meeting House that is still known to exist. In 1852, the first of two major renovations occurred. As some New England parishes demolished their old structures and built new ones when repair costs outweighed budgets, the West Parish of Barnstable opted instead to remodel the 1717 Meeting House to the neoclassical style favored in the mid-1800s. The old bell tower was torn down, a spire and belfry erected, and windows and doors were changed. Ironically, the option of remodeling instead of demolition unknowingly offered the chance to protect the 1717 Meeting House until it could be authentically restored some 100 years later in the 1950s. At the town meeting of March 16, 1871, the town discussed how they would comply with a new state mandate that all towns establish a high school. As a means of augmenting his yearly salary of $400, Reverend Henry Goodhue, the pastor of the West Parish Church, established a high school in the upstairs vestry, which was open to all students in the town of Barnstable. Years later, while repairs were being made to the upstairs loft area of the meeting house, slips of paper were found behind the plaster containing vocabulary studies of John Bursley and a composition written by one of my cousins, Darius Howland. But the West Parish was already coping with an additional challenge. The Massachusetts legislature had passed the Mass Act of Disestablishment in 1831. It was ratified in 1833. Meeting houses could no longer be used for both religious and civic affairs. The 1717 Meeting House ceased to be a venue for town and other civic meetings, but continued to be used for worship services by the church and as a school for Barnstable. As a result of the act of disestablishment, public support of the West Parish was withdrawn. With public money no longer coming in, it wasn't long before the Meeting House fell into years of spiraling disrepair. 
Restoration dreams and efforts to restore the 1717 Meeting House began in 1922 by Miss Elizabeth Crocker Jenkins and a comrade in arms, Miss Elizabeth I. Samuel. Little did they know that it was going to be a long and difficult struggle. At the annual church meeting in 1929, Miss Samuel and Miss Jenkins challenged the parishioners to pledge to a restoration fund, with Miss Samuel giving the first $25 gift. In August of 1930, Miss Jenkins produced the pageant of the Great Marshes on the slope of the meeting house as a fundraiser. Even after the 1936 death of Miss Samuel, her comrade in arms, Miss Jenkins continued her resolve to increase the totals of the Restoration Fund through the Depression years and World War II. She would often give tours of the meeting house for a quarter or quietly donate funds bequeathed to her by family to support the restoration. She was also instrumental in enlisting the help of notable historian Donald Trazer, philanthropist Charles Ayling, State Senator Edward C. Stone, and attorney Henry A. Ellis. But in spite of Miss Jenkins' efforts, the deterioration continued. In 1938, the old horse shed next to the meeting house had to be removed, as was the little house, also known as outhouse, in the back. Finally, in the 1950s, all the hard work of Miss Jenkins started to pay dividends, and good things started to happen. In May of 1950, a non-sectarian, non-profit West Parish Memorial Foundation was incorporated by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was incorporated to be separate from the West Parish of Barnstable Church and had an impressive collection of officers and trustees. Later that year, the foundation purchased 4.71 acres of land next to the meeting house, upon which a parish house was built in 1952. The parish house is where the church would gather while the meeting house was being restored. Finally, on June 29, 1953, restoration work began. A crane arrived to take down the 1723 gilded rooster weather vane, remove the revere bell and the steeple that had been added in the 1852 remodeling. The 18 feet added to the middle of the meeting house in 1723 was also removed and the building was restored to its original dimensions. Even as Miss Jenkins became ill, she continued to watch over the development of the interior restoration. Finally, on August 24, 1958, the restoration was completed and a rededication service was held. A total of $133,159 had been raised and spent on the restoration. But Elizabeth Crocker Jenkins did not live to see the completion of her beloved project. On March 24, 1956, Miss Jenkins passed away. A memorial service was held on March 27 in the nearly fully restored meeting house. Tributes were made to the remarkable lady who truly had saved the 1717 Meeting House and ensured its preservation for future generations. On October 16, 2016, West Parish of Barnstable, the congregation which worships in the Meeting House, celebrated the 400th anniversary of the founding of the church. To mark the occasion, a time capsule was placed under the Meeting House floorboards. An anthem commissioned for the occasion had its premiere and a sermon was preached by the Reverend John Dorhauer, President and General Minister of the United Church of Christ, the denomination to which the church belongs. A year later, in 2017, the 300th anniversary of the building of the Beating House was celebrated with a year's worth of lectures, programs, and concerts. The 1717 Meeting House continues its role of serving the community through public and pious uses. It's the spiritual home of the congregation, which worships in it each weekend. It continues to be maintained as a memorial to early America by the 1717 Meeting House Foundation,
which each year hosts a variety of events for the wider community, including lectures, debates, and concerts. Standing on a hill close to one of the Cape's major crossroads, the 1717 Meeting House is both a vivid reminder of our nation's past and a servant of its current needs, both public and pious.